Hello again. So, I'm continuing with uh, The Hidden Life of Trees. That's a book we've been reading and it is written by Peter Wolleben. It was originally written in German and uh, translated then to English and I don't know how many other languages, but it's a great book. And uh, we're, we're going towards the ending, um, or the, the last the last uh, stage of the book and uh, yeah so um, we're at chapter 32 and the title of this chapter is immigrants so hopefully this this is not as long as the previous chapter that was quite yeah anyway so yeah let's go thanks to the migration of trees the forest is constantly changing and not just the forest, all of nature. And that's why many human attempts to conserve particular landscapes fail. What we see is always a brief snapshot of a landscape that only seems to be standing still. The illusion is almost perfect in the forest because trees are among the slowest moving beings with which we share our world and changes in the natural forest are observable only over the course of many human generations. One of these changes is the arrival of new species. Thanks to the, the, the blue. Thanks to the botanical souvenirs, early plant hunters brought back to their homelands and more recent arrivals because of the forest industry, a huge number of tree species have been introduced that would never have found their way to Europe on their own. Names like Douglas fir, Japanese larch and grand fir don't occur in European folk songs or poems because they have not yet become fixtures in Europe's shared social memory. The process works in the other direction as well. European arrivals make their own mark when travellers in search of a new life bring memories of home along home with them in their luggage. Immigrants have a special status in the forest. In contrast to tree species, they have migrated naturally. They arrive without their typical ecosystems. In some cases, just their seeds were imported, which means that most of the fungi and all of the insects remained back in their homelands. Douglas Fir and Co. could make a completely new start in Europe. That can certainly have its advantages. There are absolutely no illnesses because of pests, at least not in the first decades. People had a similar experience in Antarctica. The air there is almost completely devoid of germs or dust, which would be ideal for people with allergies. Oh, I didn't know that. How much to go there? <laughs> Who wants to sponsor? Okay, never mind. If only the continent were not so isolated. Okay, then it's not a good idea if I go there. When trees hop over in, to a new continent with our help, it's like a big breath of fresh air for them. The lucky ones find fungal partners for their roots among the non-specialists. Beaming with health, the new arrivals grow mighty trunks in European forests and they do so in very short periods of time. No wonder they seem superior to the native species, at least in some locations. Trees that migrate under their own steam can establish themselves only where they feel completely at home. Not only the climate, but also the type of soil and the moisture levels must fit their life cycles if they're going to prevail in the presence of the old trees that already rule the forest. For trees that we humans introduce into the forest, the long-term outcome is a bit like a game of roulette. You never know exactly what's going to happen. The black cherry, for example, is a deciduous tree from North America that is wonderfully beautiful, that has a wonderfully beautiful trunk and high-quality wood when it grows there. No question, European foresters wanted to have a tree like that in their forests. But after a few decades, disillusionment set in. In their new land, the trees grew crooked and lopsided and hardly got taller than 65 feet. And they barely grew at all under the pines of eastern and northern Germany. 
The trees fell out of favour, but by now people couldn't get rid of them. Deer spurned their bitter branches, preferring to nibble away at beeches, oaks, or, if absolutely necessary, even pines. And so the black cherry got the burdensome arboreal competition off its back, the, and the newcomer keeps expanding its territory. The Douglas fir can also tell you a tale or two about the uncertainty of the future. In some places, after growing for more than a hundred years, they have become impressive giants. Other forests, however, have had to be cut down in their entirety before they matured, as I experienced firsthand in my intern year in forestry school. A small forest of Douglas firs, barely 40 years old, was beginning to die. Scientists puzzled over this for a long time. Whatever could have caused this decline? It wasn't fungi and insects were ruled out as well. The culprit finally turned out to be an excess of manganese in the soil, which apparently the Douglas firs couldn't tolerate. It also turns out that there is no such thing as the Douglas fir, as separate varieties with completely different characteristics were imported to Europe. Um, sorry about that. You know when you click the wrong button and it just jumps and get ah. Though it also turns out that there is no such such thing as Douglas fir, as the Douglas fir, as separate varieties with completely different characteristics were imported to Europe. Those from the Pacific coast are the best fit. Their seeds, however, got mixed with seeds from the inland species that grow a long way from the ocean. And to complicate the situation further, both crossbreed easily and producing offspring, all of which express characteristics that are completely unpredictable. Unfortunately, it often takes at least 40 years before you can tell whether the trees are healthy or not. If they are, they keep their vivid blue-green needles and thick crowns with tightly packed branches. The trunks of hybrids that contain too many genes from inland trees begin to bleed resin and their needles look distressed. In the end, this is simply a natural correction, albeit a cruel one. Genetic misfits are discarded even if the process plays out over many decades. Our native beaches have had no trouble showing these interlopers the door. They employ the same strategy they use in their competition with oaks. The deciding factor that has allowed beaches to win over the Douglas firs over the course of centuries is their ability to grow in the deep uh, in is their ability to grow in the deepest darkest shade under large trees. The offspring of the North American mothers need much more light and perish in the kindergartens established by our native, native deciduous trees. It is only when people lend a helping hand by repeatedly clearing trees so that the sunlight reaches the ground that the little Douglas firs stand a chance. It's dangerous when foreigners pop up that are genetically very similar to native species. The Japanese lodge is such a, a case. When it arrived here, it met the European lodge. The European lodge often, often grows crooked and in addition quite slowly. And so in the last century, it was often replaced with the Japanese tree. Both species cross easily to form hybrids. This raises the danger that one day, a long time from now, the last purebred European larches will disappear. There's just, there's just such a mixing and muddling of genes going on in the forest I manage in the Eiffel Mountains, where neither species is native. Another candidate for extinction is the black poplar, 
which mixes with cultivated hybrid poplars that have been crossed with Canadian poplars. Okay. But most introduced species pose no threat to native trees. Without our help, a number of them would have disappeared again after a couple of hundred years at the most. Even with our help, the survival of the new arrivals is questionable in the long term. For the pests that plague them to take advantage of global trade. It is true that there is no active import of these organisms. After all, who would want to introduce damaging pests? Yeah, who would want to do that? Yet, slowly but surely, fungi and insects are making their way across the Atlantic for, or, or the Pacific um, in imported lumber and establishing themselves in Europe. Often they come in packing materials such as wood pellets and haven't been heated to sufficiently high temperatures to kill harmful organisms. Whoa, okay. Oh. Okay, anyway. And parcels sent by private individuals from overseas, 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 sometimes contain, contain, oh, okay, living insects. I have personal experience of this. I had an antique moccasin from North America shipped to my home in Germany. As I unpacked the leather footwear from its new newspaper wrapping, a number of small brown beetles <laughs> crawled in my direction. I caught them as quickly as I could, squished them and disposed of them in the trash. Squishing bugs might sound odd coming from a pen of a conservationist, but introduced insects, once they get established, are life-threatening not, not only for introduced species, but also for natives. The Asian longhorn beetle poses such a threat. It probably traveled to Europe and other parts of the world from China in packing crates. The beetle is an inch long and has, an, mm, has a two inch long antenna. To us, it's a beautiful looking beetle. <laughs> okay. Mm, its dark body is flecked with white and it has black and white bands on the legs and antennae. Deciduous trees, however, find it, find it decidedly less attractive because it lays its eggs individually in numerous small splits in their bark. Voracious larvae, <laughs> I'm going to skip this chapter, <laughs> hatch and feed and adult beaches draw thumb-sized thumb exit holes in the trunk. Okay. <clears throat> I'm fine. Okay. <clears throat> These holes are then attacked by fungi and eventually the tree the trunk breaks. Oh, what what? In Europe, the beetles are still concentrated in urban areas, making life more difficult for the street kids. Those are trees. We read it in a previous chapter. The title of it is on that video, and it's also um, within this playlist, so you can find it to understand what we mean by that. Okay. Um, another import from Asia behaves very differently. This particular fungus, ash dieback fungus, is well on its way to finishing off most of the ash trees in Europe. Its fruiting bodies look harmless, even rather cute. They are just teeny weeny mushrooms that grow on the stalks of fallen leaves. The fungal filaments themselves, however, run amok in the trees and kill one another, one ash after another. A few ash trees seem to survive the repeated assaults, but uh, it's questionable whether there will be ash forests lining the banks of European streams and rivers in the future. 
in connection with this, I sometimes wonder if foresters don't play a role in the spread of the disease. I visited damaged forests in southern Germany and then afterward I was out and about in the forest I managed wearing the same shoes. Might there have been tiny fungal spores in my soles that traveled into the Eiffel Mountains as stowaways? Whatever the, qu the case may be, since then the first ash trees in Hummel have also been struck with the disease. Despite all this, I'm not anxious when I think about the future of our forests. For on large continents, and the, Euro and the Eurasian continent is the... Yeah, that literally says Eurasian continent is the largest one of all. Okay. Species have to come to grips with new arrivals all the time. Migrating birds bring small animal, fungal spores, or the seeds of new species of trees tucked in their feathers. Or these organisms are blown in by turbulent storms. A 500-year-old tree has surely had a few surprises in its life. And thanks to the great genetic diversity in a single species of tree, there is always sufficient, a sufficient number of individuals that can rise to a new challenge. If you live in or have traveled to Germany, you might as well have already noticed of some of the new naturalized avian citizens that turned up without any help from people. Perhaps the Eurasian collard dove, which arrived in Germany from the Mediterranean in the 1930s. Then there is the field fair, a type of thrush. This grey-brown bird with dark sp speckles has been migrating westward for 200 years. It started in the northeast and has now reached France. We don't yet know what, the, what surprises these birds might have brought with them in their feathers. A decisive factor in how robust native forests are in the face of such changes is how unspoiled they are. The more intact the social connections and the more moderated the clim microclimate under the trees, the more difficult it is for foreign invaders to get established. Plant the, plants that make headlines are classic examples of this. Take giant hogweed also know, known as wild parsnip or wi wild rubber, rhubarb. It originally came from the Caucasus and grows more than 10 feet tall. The white flower heads measure up to 18 inches across and because they are so pretty, the plant was imported into Central Europe and elsewhere in the 19th century. The plants escaped out of the gardens where they were planted and since then have been spreading across the countryside with ease. <laughs> Giant hogweed is considered extremely dangerous okay, because its sap in combination with ultraviolet light can burn human skin. Every year millions are spent digging up plants and destroying them without any great success. However, hogweed Hogweed can spread only because of the original forested meadows along the banks of rivers and streams that no longer exist. If these forests were to return, it would be so dark under the forest canopy that hogweed would disappear, which also grow on the riverbanks of in the absent forests. Sorry, I think I just skipped a line here. The same goes for the Himalayan balsam and the Japanese knotweed, which also grow on the riverbanks of the, in the absence of the forests. Trees could solve the problem if people trying to improve things would only allow them to take over. I have written so much about non-native species that this might be the place to address the question of what the term native means. We, we tend to call species native if they occur naturally within a country's borders. A classic example from the animal world is the wolf. 
which reappeared in most countries in Central Europe in the 1990s and since then have been considered a permanent part of the fauna. It was found in Italy, France and Poland much earlier than that. This means that the wolf has been native to Europe for a long time, just not in each individual country. But isn't even this geographic unit too broad? When we talk about perpoises being native to Germany, does that mean they also make their home in the upper reaches of the Rhine? As you can see, the, that definition wouldn't make any sense. Native must be understood on a, much, on a much smaller scale and be based not on human borders, but on habitats. Habitats are defined by their features, water, terrain, topography, and by the local climate. After the last ice age, trees moved into habitats where they found conditions that suited them. That means, for example, that spruce occur naturally and therefore can be considered native at an elevation of 4,000 feet in the Bavarian forest, but they do not occur naturally and therefore cannot be considered native 1,300 feet lower and only half a mile away, where beaches and firs hold sway. Specialists have come up with the term habitat specific which simply means each species has habitats where they are happy to grow. In, in contrast to our large-scale country borders, habitat borders for species are like proliferation for small, of small states. When people ignore these boundaries and bring spruce and pines down to warmer elevations, these conifers are not natives in this new location. They are immigrants. And with that, we have arrived at my favorite example, redwood ants. More creepy crawlies, that's so lovely. Uh, yeah, don't they serve their purpose? Okay. In Europe, redwood ants are icons of nature conservation. I was going to get those two con confused. <laughs> Conversation, conservation. Hmm. In many locations, they are mapped, protected, and in cases of conflict, resettled. There can be no objection to this because what we are talking about here is a threatened species. Threatened? And yet, redwood ants are immigrants too, and therefore I would argue that no special efforts are necessary for their protection. They travel on the coattails of commercially grown spruce and pines. You could say they hang on to needles for dear life. Yo, that's a, wow, that's a strong, scary straight statement. Yo. You could say they hang on to the needles for dear life. For without the conifer spiny, narrow needles, they can't build their anthills. And this proves that they were not present in the original native deciduous forests. Moreover, they love the sun and they need it to shine on their nests for at least a few hours a day, especially in spring and fall when it is bitterly cold. A few warm rays ensure additional days when the ants can rummage around. Dark beech woods are, therefore, ruled out as habitat, and redwood ants are forever thankful to foresters for planting huge expanses of spruce and pines. Okay, just the end of that chapter. I don't, I mean, I don't know if, I, I don't feel like I got anything from that chapter necessarily. I mean, they, mm, not necessarily, but um, maybe you can tell me if you want to comment. Some people don't want to comment. Some people will never <laughs> hear this. Um, yeah, I don't know. But uh, yeah, just short, um, sort of. <laughs> and uh, yeah, oh gosh. And then um, as part of the previous chapter, 
um, just to, I suppose, this this can be the thing that makes this chapter awesome, um, is uh, from the Bible, the New International Version, NIV. If you read um, Isaiah 61, verse 3, um, so it's the NIV version. There's many, there's many versions of it available so I mean it's sometimes interesting to look at the different versions and um, and see how how things are translated but anyway um, it was around you know my curiosity um, um, about beauty for ashes and I said in the previous video oh, I can't remember the the verse for it so I'll look it up so here we go and provide those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I mean, when I read that, I was like, <laughs> How well does it go with this book? I mean, just, yeah. And I mean, I picked the NIV because it had that wording. I mean, I just really love it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I would, Isaiah is such a wonderful, yeah. I mean, Isaiah 61, just get to that and just read just start reading it's really really lovely there are such lovely verses like very meaningful meaningful verses that are also beautiful and oh anyway um and if you don't have a bible um i suggest to get one um even if you don't read it now right now i'm not you know nobody's forcing you but you just have one handy um is a good thing should you ever want to crack it open or um maybe just for the case of so that you have a, an actual um copy that you can hold in your hand <coughs> and um because that's that's very very important it's very important and um for some reason i want to say that um you know it's it's like a collector's item it's just just it's it will do you good to have one okay but anyway um on if, if you want to have um a, a, a bible app <coughs> on your phone um i i really love um new version that's uh, y-o-u and then version and um, yeah, I think it's a really great app. It's got lovely Bible plans on it. It's just got a lot of things, and it's it's quite reliable as well. And then um, I think on the computer, um, what I've sort of um, been exploring lately, um, especially if I'm on a like some type of Zoom call and I'm, I need to pull up a scripture quickly and have different like versions underneath it or whatever. Um, and also because I don't know, no, I don't know, I just wanted to, I heard someone say Bible Hub um, at some point, and so I've been checking it out. So this is, yeah, I'm reading this from Bible Hub, and it's it's got, it's got like all the, a lot of different translations, and it's sort of um, all listed there. And then it, what's lovely about it is it's also got like suggested cross-references and things like that and I, I don't know everything about this uh, thing but I think that you can go find a lot on it so that's like, I suppose an option for the computer <laughs> um, anyway <clears throat> so yeah I just oh I see that PVK is Paul Vanderclay. He's awesome. If you don't follow him, please do. Um, the gem of a person, and um, just just a really great channel. And um, um, something that I really like about his channel, um, for me personally, is that 
like that I learned through some time, you know, by listening and sort of in, engaging, is um, that it doesn't matter what he posts, I can, I can, I feel like I can trust that whatever he's saying is actually safe to listen to and is not damaging in any way. And, uh, and I, I think that's, that's been proven true. So, yeah. And, um, There's something else that I wanted to say. I've <laughs> got a notebook here. It's good. Everyone, please. Please, please, please. Everybody <coughs> must have a notebook and a pen. I'm, I'm not going to go on and on about that, but please. please. If you don't have, let me know. And I'm going to organize for you, literally. Okay. <clears throat> these are the last two... No, no, there's a couple of them. But these are the last two scriptures that I happen to write in my notebook. Among other, quite a lot of notes. Um, some of them almost in some kind of language that I can't read because my handwriting is not so... Not the most... Um, Whatever. And this one's also from Isaiah, and it's 54 verse 7. And this, this is a great one to write down and put up somewhere and to declare and to say out loud, especially when you're feeling like a, like a bit attacked. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. Okay, and then I love this one so much. It's 1 Corinthians 16 verse 14. Um, which is let let all that you do be done in love, and um, I just think that's so beautiful. <laughs> anyway, okay, thank you, and um, yeah, I know this isn't the beginning, but skip to the to the end to get <laughs> something something good. Um, unless you got something good from. The previous reading of the chapter but what what i can say is at least we the next chapter that is coming is chapter 33 and we're like i think less than 40 pages away from the end of the book and the next one's entitled healthy forest air and um it seems positive and i think that i'm looking forward to that okay bye